Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Dimensions of Product Market Fit. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and I am a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. So as you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So definitely make sure to check out those links and resources in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you are dialing in from in the chat. We always love to connect. And second, we are going to open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions for us in that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we'll try our best to get to all of them. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, we always like to launch a couple polls to step back and see how everyone is doing in the room today. So this first one is going to ask, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? And we'll give it a few moments for people to submit a response here. Thank you, thank you. I'll give it just another moment. Awesome. I'm going to end this poll and share these results. All right. Looks like optimism is in the lead, surviving, coming up close behind. So we'll definitely take that into account um, as, you know, we continue to develop programming. Um, hopefully some of our conversation today will help address uh, those feelings as well. So I'm going to stop sharing this poll and launch that second poll. What is keeping you up at night? Finance, sales, marketing, scale, pivot, team, or surviving? And this one tells us a little bit about your current entrepreneurial needs so that we can continue to provide relevant content to all of you. Awesome. We got folks from Florida, England, Argentina, Virginia, New York, Massachusetts, Arizona, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Florida, Oregon, Texas, Tulsa, New Jersey. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing this poll and share these results. Awesome. Looks like marketing is in the lead, fitting for our conversation today, but needs all across the board. Um, you know, product market fit kind of touches on all of these to an extent. So thank you for sharing. And we'll take this into account as we continue to provide relevant programming. So I'll stop sharing this one. And without any further delay, please join me in giving the warmest welcome to Mike Miles, co-founder at O5 Advisors. Mike, it is such a pleasure to have you back with us, and I'm going to pass it right over to you. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I appreciate the fact that most of you are coming from the U.S., so good morning to you. I did see a couple of people from Western Europe as well, so good afternoon, good evening to, uh, to those folks joining from abroad. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about product market fit. Uh, as soon as my slide comes up, I will make sure I'm sharing the right one. Am I sharing the speaker view or the presentation view? This looks like the speaker view. Okay, let's see if I can do a better job here. How about now? Perfect. Great. Okay. All right, and, and as, um, as Michelle said, product market fit, in my mind, is not just focused on desirability, but really balancing desirability, feasibility, and viability. We'll get into those other two dimensions as we go through our discussion this morning. But before we do that, let me just quickly introduce myself. 
I am Mike Miles, Michael Miles, uh, some of you might know me as. Uh, I worked at Microsoft for a number of years, uh, recently retired from Microsoft, and now I teach uh, an entrepreneurship program down at the University of Arizona, uh, where I'm also a mentor in residence in, in that program. I'm also on the board of a social impact accelerator based in Boulder, Colorado, uh, called the Watson Institute. I also am an impact series uh, for that organization. I lead a series of uh, workshops, uh, social impact workshops, uh, all over the world. Coming up here in Tucson, Arizona, I'll be leading one in November. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, please reach out and let me know. I'm also a, a co-founder for a small boutique uh, startup advisory service called O5 Advisors. I'm happy to uh, talk more about that if you reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. Of course, I'm a husband um, and a dad, and I like being outdoors a lot. The most important thing on this slide, I think, is my LinkedIn information. I would love it if you connected with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear what you're doing, what you're working on, what some of your challenges are, and perhaps there's a way that I can connect with people in my network that might be able to help or offer some advice uh, on my own. Since we have people joining from all over the world, I just want to share where I've worked um, around the world. I've either worked or led teams in, in some of these places. So quite familiar with, with business and, and um, uh, how startups work in, in many places around the world. So I'm hoping that my perspectives on product market fit resonate with you, regardless of where you're dialing in from. So let's define product market fit. So product market fit, you might think of this as kind of a traditional definition of product market fit. Usually people think about product market fit really as delivering products that customers love to the point that customers are starting to drive demand, word of mouth is spreading, your customer acquisition costs are lowering and so forth. Like that's, I think, kind of a traditional definition that people might be familiar with with product market fit. And if you extend that, people tend to think the ideal process for a startup is as follows. You come up with a problem, you ideate a solution, you prototype that solution to make sure it matches the problem, you do some additional tests and, and you implement it. And then once you do that, ideally you have a product that customers love uh, and that they're willing to pay money for and spread the good word uh, to their friends and, and family about how, how great of a product that they've just purchased. That's the ideal scenario, of course. The problem with that, I think, is I feel like something is missing. Like you just using that definition where building a product that customers love is kind of the quintessential definition of product market fit. I feel like something is missing. And I'm going to tell you what I think is missing here in just a second. And then the second thing is the process doesn't feel as linear as I just described. Sometimes it feels like this jumbled mess where you're taking two steps forward and one step back and your suppliers throw you a curveball and maybe your customers are complaining about something that surprises you or you're not making as much margin as you thought. All of that kind of creates this sense that uh, maybe the process isn't as linear as you were thinking or you were hoping. So let's take a step back here for ju just a second. All of you, I'm hoping, are, are familiar with either the business model canvas or the lean canvas. I think this gives us a little clue on what's missing from that standard definition of product market fit. If you look at the business model canvas, there's actually nine sections, not just one or two. So there's nine sections that as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you should be thinking about. From the upper left, which is focused on operations, your partners and key activities and so forth, to the upper right, which is focused on customers and sales channels and your value proposition, to the bottom, which is focused primarily on viability, how you make money. So if you think about your business a little bit, the products that you're building, it really isn't just about making sure your product is desirable, I don't think. It's also about making sure your product is feasible um, operationally and viable for you to make money. So I'm going to revise that definition of product market fit, kind of set the stage for the rest of the conversation as follows. And that is product market fit is your ability to profitably develop, deliver, and support solutions that lots of customers love. And there's a, key, a couple key things in there that I think differentiate this definition from the definition that you might be familiar with. And the first one is profitably. So how do you think about deliver, developing and delivering products uh, profitably? How do you think about your margin? How do you think about your business model? The second thing is it's not just about building a product. It's also about selling, supporting, 
Uh, maybe you have a supply chain that you're worried about. It's all those operational constraints that you also have to take into account in your definition of product market fit. And then, of course, the, the key thing that people remember, and that is building a product that lots of customers love. So breaking that down or summarizing it, I think these are the three areas, three questions uh, that you should be thinking about when you're working toward product market fit for your own venture. The first one is desirability. So expanding desirability just a little bit, I think you should be including in your desirability, your understanding of desirability, uh, a couple things. One is knowing that your customers prefer your solution over the alternatives, over the competition perhaps. Um, and understanding why, why is it that they prefer your solution over the alternatives? So in thinking about desirability, those are, those are a couple things that, that you should be thinking about. Uh, in terms of feasibility, feasibility concerns itself mostly with operations. Um, your ability to build, support, supply, um, deliver uh, your, your solution. So the thing that uh, in feasibility, I think you should be thinking about understanding how you can cost effectively build, distribute, and support your solution. What's the spread between the price that you're charging and the cost that you have to pay in order to deliver that? What are you doing to reduce the cost and increase the price so that you create a bigger margin uh, for your business? All of that goes into feasibility. Right? And then lastly, viability, knowing that your costs are lower than your price, of course, but also lower than your competition. And making sure that your price is lower than your customer's willingness to pay. And we'll talk about the relationship between willingness to pay, price, and cost here in, in just a couple of minutes. So I, I want to revise the process that I shared a few slides ago and kind of expand on that a little bit and give you some examples of customer or companies that I think failed at different stages uh, of this product development process. So I would encourage everybody to think about the process, starting with a problem. Do you know what problem or opportunity you're trying to solve for your customers? Don't start with a solution, start with a problem. What is that problem that you're trying to support? And validate that it is in fact a problem and the problem is big enough that it touches lots of customers and it touches them deep enough that they're willing to pay for a solution for that problem. Unless you have a great understanding of that problem, not just how many people are affected, but how deeply they're affected, working on a solution is probably a bit premature because you may end up solving a problem that doesn't exist or doesn't exist in a way that's going to um, uh, fund your business that you're trying to start. The next step, of course, would be trying to come up with a solution. So you have a well-defined problem. There's probably multiple ways that you can solve that problem for your, for your customers. So iterating on potential solutions and making sure the solutions match the problem in terms of from your customer's perspective is what I mean by problem solution fit. If you go back to the original definition of product market fit way back uh, in the beginning of this conversation, it really was about this, the problem and solution fit. This very first step is what people tend to think of when they hear the term product market fit. But I want to expand it now. Um, but, but let me give you a couple examples of where I think companies did not do a great job of starting with a problem. They started with a solution and then tried to go find the problem that that solution solved. New Coke. I don't know how many of you remember this uh, New Coke. It turns out that Coca-Cola didn't do much market research to identify a problem that their customers were trying to solve. They thought that if they come up with a new recipe, perhaps they could reach an additional audience, or maybe people would drink more Coke because it was novel and so forth. But you may remember that it failed spectacularly. Uh, New Coke failed um, very visibly in the market, so much so that Coke had to rebrand its original formula as classic Coke so that people didn't think it was the New Coke, and then they discontinued New Coke. All of that because there was not a problem that Coca-Cola had, had um, well-defined before they came up with the solution uh, called New Coke. Segway is a similar story. So Segway... You know, the inventors of Segway thought, you know what, we're going to make it easier for people to commute long distance by foot, essentially. So the alternative to the Segway was essentially walking to work or walking to the store or walking somewhere. So the Segway kind of bridged the gap between perhaps a car, uh, between walking and, and having your own car or walking and, and mass transit. 
Same story though, they didn't validate that in fact customers had a problem walking. Uh, there was such a small niche between people that could have, could uh, walk somewhere to work or to the grocery store or take transit or a taxi or a car that there really wasn't a segment that uh, Segway uh, fit. Uh, and on top of that, riding around on a Segway, you don't look the coolest in the world uh, either. The product, product in the lower left, MSN TV, that was my very first product at Microsoft. Uh, so I, I take responsibility for that. That was a product that we built hoping to make it easier for people to get online. So what we did was, was connect that to your TV and your TV in essence was your first computer. Uh, you know, the, the democratization of, of PCs um, kind of eroded the market that we were going after. So we didn't define a problem very well either. We just came up with a solution called the MSN TV, hoping that enough customers were out there that had a problem connecting to the internet for the first time. And it turned out that market really wasn't there, okay? And Google Glass, I won't elaborate on that, but that was a similar story. Google had some technology they thought they could um, extend to a pair of eyeglasses, but there really wasn't a market there uh, either. Okay, so we're going to match the problem with the solution. That hopefully is gonna yield a product. So on the left-hand side, you now see product. And in the first stage, what you're gonna do is validate that it is in fact desirable. So a lot of validation in determining, if determining that your solution is viable. You're gonna put that product out in the market. You're gonna to get tons of feedback. You're not gonna be emotionally attached to that solution so that when you do get feedback that's contrary to your thinking, you can revise it and revise it quickly and get another product out there that you can continue to test. All of that is in service to trying to make sure that your solution is desirable. The next step I would argue is to make sure that your solution is feasible for you to build and support and, and supply and, and sell. Uh, and so in the operational optimization phase, which is phase number three, that's what you should be working on is making sure that once you have a product that's desirable by your customers, you then have a product that is feasible for you to support. Let me give you some examples where uh, the product wasn't feasible. So many of you know the story about McDonald's. McDonald's had this new McFlurry machine. Um, how many of you have been to a McDonald's where you couldn't get your McFlurry? Probably many of us have, have been, the machine is broken or something. The challenge with the new McFlurry machine is essentially one of operations. It was poor quality. Their uh, support channels were not well established. They didn't anticipate the demand for the product. And so the, the machine that made the product, the McFlurry, essentially fell over and caused a lot of challenges for, uh, for McDonald's. The Galaxy Note 7, uh, the challenge there you may remember is uh, battery life and batteries that would catch fire. So how many of you have been, uh, how many of you checked in bags at an airport where they said, hey, do you have any batteries uh, in your checked in luggage? The reason that they ask that question now is because of the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Those devices would catch on fire on, on the airplane sometimes, and of course, risks um, and danger associated with that is the reason now that FAA requires all airlines to check to see if you have batteries. So quality issues with, uh, with the Galaxy Note 7. They did a good job on desirability. Customers love that product, but the poor quality with their battery, the supplier that was providing that battery, uh, they had challenges with. And then the, remember the fire festival? The fire festival was the biggest party that never happened. That was Netflix's tagline for the documentary about this, uh, about this big music festival. If I could give you one goal in life, it's never to be the target of a Netflix documentary about how poorly you did something, okay? So Netflix, go check out this documentary. Essentially, they came up with this music festival Customers love this idea. They pay good money to go spend a weekend on this island. It's a very exclusive event, very high ticket uh, uh, event. But the producers of this festival actually failed to deliver. Um, uh, housing was suboptimal, food was poor. The musicians that they uh, thought that they were gonna be able to schedule didn't want to attend. Just a bunch of challenges in terms of execution. They did a good job on desirability, but in terms of feasibility, uh, they fell short. Okay, the last step here is viability. So once you have a good handle on desirability, your, your product is desirable by your customers and feasibility, you know you can build and support it. Then you need to focus on viability. Are you gonna be able to make money for it? 
And I express this in a way that's kind of a linear process, but we all know that these things are all related. And so there should be some iteration. The trade-offs you make perhaps in feasibility might impact desirability. The, this, the, uh, the work that you're doing to ensure viability may in, in fact uh, impact feasibility. Okay? So even though it looks like this is a linear process, of course it's not. Of course you need to kind of iterate through desirability, feasibility, uh, and, and viability as you go. So I want to now shift gears toward uh, what I think are some maybe pro tips toward achieving desirability and viability. Feasibility, I'm not going to cover today because it's such a big topic that perhaps I'll come in a later session and, and share some additional thoughts around feasibility. But I wanted to share some of my, my thinking about desirability and, and viability, just so you have some go-to uh, actions that maybe you can take with your own, with your own venture. So let's start with desirability. So my tips for desirability, I'll get into each of these here in just a second. But the first one is to prioritize psychographics over demographics. How many of us try to market to an audience that we define demographically only to realize that doesn't tell us why customers are buying? It might indicate who's buying our product, but it doesn't shed any light on why they're buying our product. So I'll talk about that in, in just a second. The next thing is understanding non-customers. Um, uh, I'll give you a little teaser. Your target audience of non-customers is actually bigger than your target audience of customers. And so what can you do to understand why non-customers are not buying your product, I think is as important as understanding why customers are buying your product. And then lastly, uh, focusing on the whole experience. So those are the three things I'm gonna talk about now. The first one is psychographics over, over demographics. So if you look at the left-hand side, left-hand side describes me, um, I am uh, hate to say it, uh, 52 years old, uh, male, I live about a 45 minute drive from the uh, Mariners um, uh, baseball stadium. My income is whatever it is. Uh, I have a college education, I'm married with two kids. Okay. Does that give you any clue on why I would buy your product? It, it doesn't doesn't help you understand why I would buy your, your product at all. What it may do is allow you to buy, you know, magazine ads or social media advertising or, or radio spots because, you know, those channels, advertising channels can actually target users based on demographics, but it doesn't help you understand why those customers might buy your product or why those target customers might buy your product. Instead, if you were the Seattle Mariners, you probably would want to understand things like I'm listing on the right-hand side. So I've been a fan for over 20 years, uh, ever since I moved up to Seattle. Um, I happen to have attended the coldest game in, in Mariner history. Um, Edgar Martinez, a uh, famous Mariner baseball player, attended our wedding. Um, uh, I regularly attend spring training down here in, in Arizona. And then the reason that my wife and I got so interested in the Mariners is because we can go on a date for 20 bucks, including food. Uh, so back when, when income was a little bit uh, shorter supply, you know, that was the reason that we became fans in the first place is it was a good place for us to go, uh, go on a date. You see pictures below, like my, uh, I don't know how old he is, maybe my six or eight month old son sleeping on my lap at a Mariner game with his own little Mariner hat. Uh, and the picture to the right is my wife and I at, at the coldest game in Mariner, uh, Mariner history. So that, I think, though, that psychographic information actually gives you much better understanding of why I might buy Mariner tickets than, this, than the demographic information on the right. And so I would challenge you to like, understand your customer psychographically much more so than demographically, because that's going to give you much better insight on why they might buy your product. Right? So that's tip number one. Tip number two, I said that your non-customers uh, might be more interesting than, than your target customers. And the reason why is because your target customers, your current market, is actually a subset of the entire market that includes people who aren't buying your product, right? That, that kind of makes sense. If you're able to explore why customers are not buying your product, that could do a, a, a few things for you. The first is that maybe there's reasons why they're afraid of technology or you're missing a key feature or they have some brand loyalty to some competitor. You know, just understanding those reasons 
I think allows you to expand, uh, gives you the potential, the opportunity to expand your market um, more, more than just your, your target customers. So I would encourage you to look for customers who, you know, soon to be customers, they're exploring different options out there. And maybe your product is one of the things that they're, one of the choices that they're considering. The next group would be the refusers, people that say, look, I don't need that product. Why would I need that product? Understanding why they're saying they don't need that product, I think can give you hints about how to adapt your value proposition or maybe your feature set so that you can turn those refusers into buyers. And then lastly, unexplored. These are people who have no idea that they actually need a product such as yours. Uh, so they don't yet know that there's a problem or an opportunity that your product uh, addresses. And so educating them about what opportunities um, your product solves might be the first step for them. If you do that, like I said, the audience, the total audience that includes soon to be refusers and unexplored users is much bigger than I think what most people consider as their target audience. And so put some work into understanding why those people might be refusers or soon to be's or uh, unexplored users. And then lastly, focusing on the whole experience. And, and the reason that I suggest this is because most often customers buy a product and stay loyal to a product, not because what it does for them, but how that product makes them feel. If they feel like the company understands them as a person and is empathetic toward their needs and proactively addresses their concerns when they have them, all of that wrapped around the product is the reason that customers tend to stay loyal. And so a few companies that I think do this very well, Zappos return policy uh, is, is noteworthy. Um, Alaska Airlines, um, their service greeter. So I'm a frequent flyer on Alaska Airlines. I travel back and forth between Arizona and Seattle a lot. Um, so I'm a frequent flyer. When I check in, at, uh, when I get onto the cabin, uh, often one of the flight attendants says, hey, how was your trip to in this case, when I came down to Tucson a couple of weeks ago, how was your trip to Paris? Alaska doesn't fly to Paris. So how did they know that I went to Paris over the summer? Well, that's because Alaska is part of this one world network. Uh, and because of that, they knew my, my previous travel history. And so just that little connection, that little connection of, hey, how was your, how was your trip to Paris? Even though Alaska didn't fulfill that part of the journey, to me, made made me feel like, gosh, these guys are just on top of it. They they know what's going on. They know what's going on in their passengers' lives, and by extension, they care about it. And then, lastly, I don't know how many of you have a Trader Joe's in your neighborhood, but one of the things that Trader Joe's does, they don't do self checkout. And the reason they don't do self checkout is because they want one of the Trader Joe's employees to interact with the customer every time they come into the store. And, and the, uh, every employee that interacts with a customer is an extension of the customer service that Trader Joe's uh, offers. How many of you have been to the grocery store and you just don't talk to anybody? Uh, you can go to most grocery stores today and check out, go do your shopping, push your cart around, check out and never talk to a soul uh, at the market. That's not Trader Joe's ethos. They want you to connect with one of their employees because their employees are an extension of their brand. Okay. So those are just some examples of how you can focus on the experience. Uh, and just to recap, in terms of desirability, psychographics over demographics, try to understand your non-customers, and then think about the whole experience. Let's shift to viability. My tips on viability, uh, focus on willingness to pay and willingness to sell. And I'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. The second is understanding Porter's five forces uh, to determine your pricing and purchasing leverage. Uh, and I'll get into that. That's a little bit technical, but I'll get into that in just a second. And then lastly is experiment with different uh, business models. You might be thinking you're kind of a razor and blade or a freemium to premium service or a subscription-based or an ad-supported business, whatever. But, uh, but it makes sense, I think, for you to play with different business models and see what your customers want you to be from a business model uh, monetization perspective. Okay, so focusing on willingness to pay, the, the key thing in willingness to pay is that typically people think about when they're pricing their, their product, they think about what price can I get away with? Like what maybe what, the, what is the competition pricing their product at? Maybe I wanna be just below or just above that. I wanna be below if I wanna kind of be the low cost alternative. I wanna be above if I wanna be perceived as a premium alternative. But that's the extent to which they think about pricing, okay? 
If that's you, it's okay. I'm not asking for a show, <laughs> show of hands this morning, but that's kind of the traditional way to think about uh, price, uh, unfortunately. And the second thing is, of course, keeping costs low. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer if, if you own your, your own business. But I think there's a little bit more sophisticated way to think about that, but I'm going to talk about now. And that is to set your price, you don't just need to know what the competition is doing. It's actually much more important for you to know what your customer's willingness to pay for your product is. So if your customer's willingness to pay for your product is 20 bucks a month or $500 one time only or, or whatever, that allows you to set your price underneath it. It doesn't matter so much what the competition is doing if you know the relationship between your customer's willingness to pay for your product and the price that you set. As long as the price is lower than willingness to pay, then in the eyes of your customer, you're creating value for them. Okay? They're willing to pay 100 bucks, but you're only charging them 80. They feel like they got a $20 deal. So understanding what your customer's willingness to pay and investing in improving that, driving your willingness to pay up, gives you the latitude to increase your price upward as well. Related to that is willingness to sell. So your suppliers sell you um, uh, maybe goods and services that you build your product upon. Understanding what your supplier's willingness to sell is and optimizing that could also help you drive your costs lower. Right? And some ways that you can drive willingness to sell would be um, uh, perhaps buying in bulk. Uh, perhaps signing a, a one-year exclusive agreement with a supplier so that they know you're not going to go shop around for the best deal somewhere else. You know, those kinds of things can encourage your suppliers to reduce uh, reduce their cost and consequently, I'm sorry, reduce their price to you and consequently reduce your cost. And we all know that the spread between price and cost, that's your per unit margin. Okay, so focus on willingness to pay and willingness to sell gives you the opportunity to increase your price and lower your, your cost, thus your margin. In terms of Porter's Five Forces, I'm obviously not gonna talk about every single bullet on this slide, but Porter's Five Forces, just a reminder, it's an industry analysis that tells you how much power your suppliers have, your customers have, how much competition there is, and how much uh, customers are aware of alternatives uh, to your product that may or may not be a competitor. Okay? Understanding that can also help you set um, uh, pricing and, and uh, supply, pay your suppliers as well. If you know that the number of suppliers is high in your industry, you can shop around for the best deal and probably command a much lower price. If there's only one supplier that supplies what you need and that thing that you need is critical to your product, there's no way that you're going to negotiate effectively with that supplier. You're kind of stuck with whatever that price is. Similarly with customers, if there's tons of customers that are out there, um, it's likely that you're able to set, um, uh, set a higher price because there's lots of customers. Maybe some of those customers are willing, to, are, are willing to pay a little bit higher price. You're happy to let those customers that are a little more price sensitive go to a competitor. Uh, just understanding where you fit in Porter's Five Forces, like I said, gives you the leverage to figure out where you can set your price uh, for your product and how you can control your cost from your suppliers. And then I just want to uh, remind you of business models that are quite popular uh, today. The admonishment I have for you, the encouragement I have for you is that you might think your business model um, is predetermined, you know, based on your product, but I'd encourage you to reach out to your customers and get their perspective about how they're willing to pay for your product. It may not be a subscription business. Uh, it may not be a razor and blade kind of business or, uh, you know, an inkjet printer with, with ink kind of business. Um, you know, they may be willing to pay for your product, but not in the ways that your business model uh, uh, defines for them. So reach out to customers as part of your viability um, exploration and try to understand how they're interested in, in paying for that product. Maybe they're interested in being, your product being an ad support product. Maybe they hate ads and are willing to pay you five bucks a month to use your product. Just go explore that because you're going to be surprised about how different customers are willing to fund your product uh, differently. Okay, lastly, I just wanna close on how you know if you've achieved product market fit. So I'm gonna start with the opposite, how you know you haven't achieved product market fit. If word of mouth about your product isn't spreading, ultimately you wanna reduce your CAC, your customer acquisition costs. And the only way you're gonna be able to reduce your customer acquisition costs is if customers are selling your product on your behalf. 
But if customers are not big fans of your product, they're not going to do that for you. So if word of mouth isn't spreading, you know something is wrong from a desirability perspective, maybe a pricing perspective. Um, if customers download your product, let's say you're an app, but don't use it or use it as frequently as you want, that could be a good indicator. Uh, your operations is costly or cumbersome or error prone or low quality. Um, you're losing money. It's okay to lose money initially. Almost every single startup loses money initially, but over time, you have a path toward per unit um, uh, per unit path to profitability. You know that you can start making money on each unit that you sell. Unless you know what those steps are, I don't think you've achieved product market fit either. Uh, and then your cost basis is higher than the competition. Uh, now, there could be strategic reasons why that's the case. Maybe use premium ingredients or premium materials or you have an exclusive supplier or, or, or what have you. But without a good understanding of why your product might be more expensive than the competition, uh, I think you still have some work to do in achieving product market fit. The problem is that knowing when you have achieved product market fit, you know, it's easy to know that you haven't, but how do you know that you have achieved product market fit? I think these are some useful metrics that you can keep in mind. Driving down your customer acquisition costs, driving down your cost of goods sold. Um, understanding what your net promoter is. Your net promoter is a measure of how willing your customers are to spread the good word about your product to other uh, potential customers. Um, time to value, that is by the time I install the product that I just bought, how quickly am I getting value from that product? If it takes days because of a learning curve or configuration requirements, or I have to enter a bunch of defaults, that time to value can erode customers' perspective about the value they're actually providing. So making sure they're getting value right away as soon as they uh, get their your product home or download it to your phone or, or what have you is a very, very useful metric in terms of managing their perspective about the value that you're creating. Um, another one, support costs. You know, How many incidents per customer are you generating? How quickly are you able to resolve those incidents uh, is another good measure of, of, um, of uh, feasibility. And then your willingness to pay should be going up. Not necessarily your price. There may be a strategic reason why you're keeping your price where it is, but customers' willingness to pay about your product should be increasing over time. Okay. I know that we went through a lot uh, in about 35 minutes or so, but I know we also have a bunch of questions. So let me wrap up there and we'll switch over to Q&A. And Michelle, if you wanna come back on and, and uh, share whatever questions we have from the audience, I'd, I'd be happy to take those. Awesome, Mike. Thank you so much. That was just really such a great overview um, and an awesome framework that entrepreneurs can kind of practically apply to their own business. So that, that was great. Um, we definitely have lots of questions coming in. So if you're in the audience and you have any, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so to start off, um, kind of looking at the feasibility aspect a little closer, when you're evaluating your key partners, activities, and resources, how might entrepreneurs identify and fill gaps in their strategy or their operations to better support the success of their offering? Yeah, you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to answer that question a little bit today because we didn't spend much time on, on feasibility. Sure. But let's assume for a second that you have some operational metrics uh, in place. I think understanding where your metrics are, are there's a gap in between your current metrics and your aspirations for those metrics. Or sure. Um, is your supplier actually able to move the needle in the right direction? That'd be the very first thing that I would that I would ask. The yeah. second thing I would ask is how much does that supplier actually impact your viability, your, your cost? Mm. Remember, we're trying to keep the cost the same or lower than the competition unless you want to be perceived as a premium product. If a supplier is charging a higher price without you being able to drive your product's willingness to pay, I, I think that could be a challenge. So mm -hmm. two things I would look at. One is, are they helping you move your metrics in the right direction? Right. And obviously, that presupposes that you have metrics well-defined that help you understand your operations. And the second is, it's not uh, uh, polluting your ability to drive your path to profitability from a viability standpoint. Yeah, yeah, that's so important, especially just that emphasis on like these kind of dimensions are not silos. They all work together um, always. So that's awesome. Um Looking at kind of, you know, trying to understand why customers or people buy, um, you know, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a good understanding of like what categories might be used when looking at like demographics, but like 
how can entrepreneurs better like measure why people buy and identify patterns among those categories to create higher quality customer experiences? Yeah, there, there's a great framework uh, that I didn't introduce today, but uh, but I, I love a lot. And that is called the jobs to be done uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And jobs to be done, I think there's three categories of jobs. There's functional and social and emotional. Um, if you if you take a look at me, I'm a big Mariners fan. Uh, we talked about my psychographics um, in one of our slides a little bit earlier today. The reason I go to Mariner games isn't because the Mariner games are solving some functional need of mine. They're solving some emotional need of mine. Like my wife and I, this is something that we do together and we have for a very long time. And like that emotional need is, is why we, we buy. Maybe social, maybe we'll go out with friends as well, but right. primarily it's not a functional need that, that the Mariner game is addressing for us. It's kind of this emotional, uh, emotional need. Mm -hmm. And so understanding your product and how it fulfills your customers' functional, social, and emotional needs, um, I, I think is one of the biggest keys to understanding how you can position your product and, and, and market your product and even define your product. So it's addressing not just functional, but also social and emotional. Totally. And totally. And that just goes to show like the under, like the need to understand those factors beyond, um, you know, like those social and emotional factors that play in, you know, and it, it can be difficult to kind of recognize what those are. And it kind of just goes back to like knowing your customer really well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll, can I can I just spend 30 seconds giving you some anecdote? Oh. I, there's a couple of colleagues of mine also from Microsoft on the call. One of the things that Microsoft did very poorly for a number of years is that they marketed their products purely on functionality. Mm. If you go in and buy a version of Word, you flip it over and on the back, there's two columns of features that that product uh, uh, provided. Right. Spell checker and a thesaurus and, you know, be able to change the fonts and so forth. It It turns out that what customers wanted mostly was not all those features, many of which they're never going to use, right, but right. they wanted emotionally the confidence that if they did something in Word, it was going to look fantastic. Yeah. Like that's what they wanted. That was the, the emotional need that, that Word is addressing for customers. And, and Microsoft is slowly starting to realize that, but for a very long time, they did not. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really really interesting point because I I mean I definitely know as someone who uses Word, not all those features uh, come into use, but I, it does leave me wondering why am I going back to that? So that's just such a great example. Um, love that. Um, so you talked about the importance of knowing non-customers, and I saw that we had an entrepreneur kind of ask about this in the chat. Um, how might entrepreneurs balance the need to convert or like just know those non-customers with the need to support the customers that they already have without spreading themselves or their resources thin? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a good question. And I think that um, probably again speaks to speaks to metrics. I if you have customers and you know that with the, your current Tam Samsung, your current market um, mm -hmm. that you're reaching, that you can get to per unit profitability, then that would be my first my first focus. Sure. Um, and making sure that your current customer, your target market is satisfied with your product is hands down your, your first priority. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes though, um, this speaks to, you know, maybe I don't have enough customers for me to drive the scale that I need in order for my business to be uh, to be profitable. That's when I would start to think about uh, think about non-customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's that's a not really a hard, fast rule because, you know, sure. what you may be worried about as, as an entrepreneur is that your competitors are going to go get those non-customers before you do. Right. And so you might make a strategic choice to go after them, even though you know that in the you know medium term, you can get the profitability with your current target market. You may go mm -hmm. after those customers because you don't want your competitors to. Yeah. And that, that actually makes me kind of just wonder about a question that we had gotten from, from one of our entrepreneurs in the audience, it's kind of related to what you just said, but um, how might this framework, uh, you know, look similar or different um, for an entrepreneur who's solving like a known validated problem, which would mean that there's existing com competition versus an entrepreneur focusing on like a completely unmet need? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a good question. Uh, the the thing that I would encourage you to think about, if if you're working in a, and I don't know if the term red ocean and blue ocean kind of resonate, but if you're working in a red ocean where there's lots of competition, 
Mm-hmm. The way that you're going to survive in that is that either your product is better or your margin is bigger, mm-hmm. right? The difference between your price and your cost is, is bigger. One of those two things has to be true yeah. um, for you to survive as uh, in, in a red ocean market. And so it's possible that in order to get your, your economies of scale low enough where you're able to drive your costs, you actually need to go after a bigger market. That could be one reason why you start to explore non-customers. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing could be that, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to make your product better, ex- uh, trying to understand how the, the uh, unexplored customer set isn't even considering products like yours may right. allow you to define your product in such a way where you're creating value beyond your target market. Right. Those are the two things that I, I would uh, I would start with first. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's, those are really good points. And like, again, I, I love kind of just this emphasis on like, go back to the metrics. It's like, let them kind of, you know, you, you don't need to do the guesswork. Um, that's, that's why kind of like those measurements are there to like help you make more informed decision making. So I, I love that you're highlighting that. Absolutely. Um, so um, looking just then more deeply at like psychographic information, um, what like what strategies can entrepreneurs employ once they kind of understand what makes people buy to accurately determine the customer's willingness to pay? And I'm guessing they're like, my, it's like a formula kind of that you might want to go through or like what kind of way of thinking m- might they apply to, to determine that? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's three different things that I, I would take a look at. The first is, uh, I think we spoke about this before this webinar even started, that product market fit is never a destination. It's always a journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for the life of your business, you should be evaluating desirability, feasibility, and, and viability because market conditions change, com- competition landscape change, and so forth. Mm-hmm. So under the assumption that you're always looking at product market fit, I think one of area of research that you should continue to invest in is understanding why your customers are buying your product from a jobs to be done perspective, not just functionally, but also what social and emotional needs uh, your, your product is meeting. If you have a good understanding of that and you're amplifying the social and emotional reasons that they're buying their product, that gives you the latitude, I think, in order to charge more money. Mm-hmm. Usually adding one more feature from a functional standpoint doesn't allow you to increase your willingness to pay. Sure. You know, using the the word example, like who cares if now it supports this additional font? Uh, right. Nobody, yeah. Right. Um, but if I can say, look, you know what, your the the output from Word is going to make you look like a superstar, or it's going to make you look so smart in the eyes of of your peers, or something like that. That can come. You know what? For that product, I'm going to spend an extra ten bucks. You bet. Totally. Yeah. And so the first, it starts with kind of understanding what are the social and emotional needs that your customers the reasons that they have for buying your product Mm -hmm. uh, and then amplifying those in terms of positioning or value creation or whatever, uh, and use that to drive willingness to pay. Sure. Um, So looking a little bit more at kind of like pricing strategy and evaluating competition, love the Porter's five forces framework. It's it's really fantastic to kind of like give you direction. Um, So, but, and I know pricing strategy is kind of like a whole different conversation, but at a high level, how can entrepreneurs avoid underselling their offering and failing to capture the maximum value for their business? I, I think it starts with a strategic choice about who you are. Um, are do you want to be perceived in the market as the low cost alternative or the premium product or you know on par with the competition? So having a good understanding of that, I, I think is, Maybe not the first thing, but it's certainly key to understanding the answer to your question. Right. Um, the, the next thing is, depending on how agile your product is, mm-hmm. you can also play with pricing. You know, you can incrementally increase pricing and see where demand kind of influx downward. Right. And, you know, once you do that, kind of back off a little bit so that it's no longer uh, inflecting downward, it's still kind of demand is still kind of increasing a little bit, I think yeah. could be another uh, another useful strategy. And then the last, the last, well, maybe two, two other things. One is your price should always be relative to your willingness to pay. And so without understanding where your, willing, your customer's willingness to pay is, it's very hard to set that price. 
Sure. You never want your price to be above their willingness to pay because then they're going to feel like they've been cheated. Yeah. But if you can create, you know, a relationship between willingness to pay and price where they feel like they're getting some value, uh, that, that of course is ideal. So that's one thing. And then the other is what are your co- uh, customer or not customers, sorry, competitors charging? Mm-hmm. And, and do you have a sense for how fast they're growing? That'll give you some clues about maybe your pricing sensitivity as well. Awesome. That's great. Well, it is time for live Q&A. So if you are in the audience and you have a question for us, please make sure to submit it. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So I already got a bunch coming in. Let's jump right in. Um, you know, you, you just mentioned um, a, a few moments ago, kind of, Um, the importance of thinking about product market fit as like a continuous process versus something that's like completed early on. Um, Can you talk more about why that's so important? Yeah, I I think that I hinted at this a couple minutes ago. The the big thing is that nothing is ever static, Mm -hmm. right? The market conditions are going to change from today to tomorrow to the next day. You might have more competition. Your customer, the economy might might be trending downward, and we might be entering a recession. So customers might be more price sensitive. Mm-hmm. Um, it's possible that your your customers are using your product in a way that you didn't imagine, and so understanding that and maybe capitalizing on that could be a, an opportunity uh, for you to drive more growth in your business. Mm-hmm. Everything is always changing around you. You know, you you can never just kind of dial in product market fit and assume that's going to be the case for the next 20 years or so. So that's the biggest, uh, the biggest, I think. The second is that, you know, I, uh, I intentionally on my metric slide, the second to last slide on my deck, I had trend arrows on every single one of those metrics. You want it to be going up or going down. Um, You always have an opportunity to improve whatever metric. And so uh, whether you're reducing cost or increasing willingness to pay or reducing uh, cost per incident, all of those metrics, um, those are all journeys and not destinations. And so continuing to have, uh, evaluate product market fit so you understand that the trend is continuing in the right direction for all the metrics that you care about, I think would be the other reason. Awesome. Love it. Um, we have an entrepreneur asking kind of about like collaborators and partners and if they might be helpful in, in finding product market fit. So what advice do you have potentially for entrepreneurs looking for a collaborator or partner before reaching product market fit? Hmm, I might uh, encourage that person to reach out to me on on LinkedIn for just a little bit more context, but I'll I'll tell you what comes to mind right now. And that is if your product naturally uh, supports compliments, you know, a good example is is your iPhone, right? A big compliment to your iPhone is the um, is the App Store. Without the App Store, your phone is not worth nearly as much, right? So, it turns out Apple owns both of those. Uh, but you can imagine a situation where a compliment to your product is actually delivered by somebody else. Sure. Um, so that would be probably the classic example is where your customer's expectation about value includes not just the product you're delivering, but also the compliment that your partner is, is delivering. Awesome. Um, yeah, that, that'd be the biggest thing that I would think about. I, I would want more contact to make sure I fully answer that question. Uh, but but yeah, that's at least my initial reaction. Yeah, yeah. No, that's super helpful. Um, we have a couple entrepreneurs wondering kind of, um, you know, about, again, how this process might be similar or different if you're like, a B2B or a B2C or a B2B2C, um, B2G even. So is, is it different at all or is it kind of the same? Uh, I mean, at the level we spoke about today, I would say it's the same. Sure. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think that consumers, it's a lot easier to understand their jobs to be done. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to understand your product's ability to fulfill their social and emotional needs than, say, selling to a, a company. Yeah, uh, companies tend not to have emotions, right? People in the companies do, but the company itself tends not to have emotions. And so, how how do you uh, think about jobs to be done in that context? Usually, the key thing is understanding the jobs to be done of the decision makers mm-hmm. in that company. Uh, is is kind of my go-to uh, example. It's still important. You still want the person that's buying uh, buying your product or or creating a, a deal with you to feel like they've made a good decision. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you remember that old phrase, you never get fired for buying IBM. The reason that that's true is because you can be confident that IBM has a known quality, known price and, and so forth. So, right. uh, so I would still say jobs to be done works, but you need to, instead of applying that to the company itself, apply that to the decision makers in the company. And that can be harder to understand. Mm-hmm. The CTO yeah. isn't necessarily going to uh, open the kimono about the jobs to be done that he's looking for. Um, totally. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really important distinction. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And we have an interesting one from an entrepreneur kind of just wondering, you know, I think this stems from like when you were mentioning, like when you're trying to figure out willingness to pay and like you're kind of testing it out and it dips, like as you're, you know, that's one example, but as you're kind of just like testing your product, testing your model, um, how can you ensure that you're not affecting the trust and loyalty of, of your customers? While, while you're evaluating willingness to pay? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like while you're testing different things out, maybe you make a price, like the price of something higher and then you lower it again. Like how can you kind of maintain trust through that process? Yeah. So two, two things come to mind. If, if your product allows you to do kind of A, B testing, usually online products allow you to do that. I'm going to send a certain portion of my audience this version of the UX and a different portion this version of the UX. Yeah. They generally don't even know. Um, right. Uh, so if you can do that, hallelujah, that's great. But the other thing is, I don't think you should steer away from telling customers, look, Michelle, I really value your opinion. You're a loyal customer. Um, you're exactly the kind of customer that we're trying to attract. Would you mind if I you know, tried a new feature out on you or got your perspective yeah. about how this thing works? You know, That, I think, can bring those customers onto your side of the fence instead of keep them on the other side of the fence. And maybe even generate more loyalty because they they feel like you're trusting them and they're part of the journey uh, with you. So that'd be the second thing I'd consider anyway. Yeah, sometimes it's that transparency really is so meaningful. Uh, I love that. Awesome. We are just about to be out of time. But Mike, if you had one key takeaway or just piece of wisdom um, around this topic that you wanted to leave with the audience, what would that be? I'll put an and in it so I can cheat and and have two. And one is it's always the relationship between desirability, feasibility, and viability. It's not one of those in isolation. And the second thing is it's a journey. Like you're never, ever, as long as your company is in business, you're never, ever going to be done evaluating product market fit. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much for just such an incredible session and sharing these insights. Uh, The NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center is so grateful that you joined us once again. Um, And to our audience, we would love for you to join us again for upcoming webinars, which you can view by using that link in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you join us again for upcoming webinars soon.